In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, You who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of all that is good, and master of life, come, dwell within us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, we're going to be reflecting on the 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time, uh, which means we're getting very close to the end of the liturgical year. Pretty soon, uh, be Christ the King. Could even be next week. Uh, first thing we're going to do is look at Verbum Domini. And I'm going to read part of paragraphs 36 and 37, and then... I'm going to discuss it, and it may take a few weeks, but it's so key to our learning to have a biblical understanding of reality that it's going to be worth it, I'm quite sure. Uh, At least I sure hope it is. Um, um, The two levels, the Pope here, we're going to start with 36 and move into 37. The unity of the two levels of script of the interpretation uh, presupposes the harmony of faith and reason. If I can investigate with reason, including historical reason, and uh, understand in faith, you see, they're not in conflict. There's only one truth. And so they can't be in conflict. Uh, is it hard to figure out sometimes? Yes. And uh, the Arabs have a proverb, you see. Let us leave a little work for our children. And that's what we're doing. You know, we need to leave work for our children. And we've left them plenty. Um, now, after having said that, uh, he moves into the literal and spiritual sense. And... Uh, a very important paragraph, one of the longest in the document. Uh, it covers two and a third pages, um, this one paragraph. And I want to take a couple of weeks, as I mentioned, to work on it. You see, uh, I'll read out the first two sentences. A significant contribution to the recovery of an adequate scriptural hermeneutics, as the Synodal Assembly stated, can also come from renewed attention to the fathers of the church and their exegetical approach. The church fathers present a theology that still has great value today because at its heart is the study of sacred scripture as a whole. Indeed, the fathers are primarily and essentially commentators on sacred scripture. There was a time, not in our age, when theology was scripture. St. Thomas was a magister sacri pagine. He taught scripture. Now he wrote a summa because beginners have to, you know, not be overwhelmed with too many diverse ideas and too many. So he wrote, put it all out in order. He quit before he finished because he had that huge experience of God. And he just said, oh, I'm not going to write anymore. What I've written is like straw. I'm not going to write anymore. So he never finished. Somebody else finished for him by taking pieces of what he wrote elsewhere, but it's not of the same quality as that whole renewed thing that he was doing himself. But as he says in the beginning of the Summa, this is for beginners. He himself, I don't think, ever taught the Summa. He taught Scripture. And that's very important because that's where the Theologia is. All right. Now, uh, the Pope goes on to say, See, the patristic modus of interpreting Scripture was through what, through what is called the spiritual sense. The spiritual sense is an understanding of reality. It's not an imposition on the text. Now, when you're working with just with, only with historical critical methods, this seems like a foreign imposition. But when you're working with a faith vision, you see 
what it's all about. St. Thomas has beautiful treatise a couple of places. The longest one is in Quadri Betum. And we'll return to that. Uh, when human beings speak or write, words stand for things. Huh? Verbum stands for res. When God writes, not only does the verbum stand for the res, but the res can stand for another res. The thing can stand for something else. That's the basic notion of histori- of uh, spiritual reading, spiritual sense. The foundation for that is what? That the Lord is the Lord of history. And therefore, the exodus is an exodus, but it's also standing for that freedom of God that is going to come through the death and resurrection of Christ. That is why, if you read the New Testament, 80 and more percent of the words that are used to describe the act, the effects of the act of loving which Jesus died in rose, all come from the book of Exodus. Redemption, salvation, purchase, these are all Exodus terms. You see, it's as though uh, the, uh, the Old Testament is like a prism and you hold it up against Jesus in the act of love on the cross, dying and giving his life for us. And that pure white light, which is too hard for our minds, our eyes, is broken down into red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. In other words, it breaks it down so that we can get it. Let me give you another example. I think I've given you this before. Uh, Jesus weeps over our sins. He's pained by our sins, still is, by our sins. How do I understand that? I mean, he's God, he's the Son of God. Look at David. David, weeping over Absalom. Absalom rebelled against him, was trying to kill him. Had disgraced him by taking all his wives and sleeping with them on the roof of his palace so the whole world could see it. Now he's going to, after having disgraced him, he's out to kill him. Well, Joab kills Absalom. Now, this should be good news to David, huh? But when he gets the news, what does he do? He weeps. And he says, Absalom, Absalom, Beni, Beni, Absalom, Me ye tenly, who will give to me that I might die for you? Absalom. Who's that? That's Jesus. David is an anticipated realization of the mystery of Jesus. So the spiritual sense of that text is Jesus' care for us, weeping over us. You see? So that you understand that the spiritual sense of Scripture is primarily a spiritual sense of history, not a spiritual sense of text. Because it's res standing for res. Now, this is extremely important. Uh, the one, the person who uh, most constructed this was Origen, building on the work of Irenaeus. It's a very fine article. Uh, the author slips my mind for the moment. Uh, he points out how the conundrum of the Old Testament faced the early Christians. And they, by that time, they were having a, a New Testament being written and worked on it. And so, first you had the letter of Barnabas, who said that everything in the Old Testament is meaningful, but it all has to be allegorized. It's, it's exhausting to read it, and it doesn't make any sense, really. Uh, all allegorized. This stands for that, and this stands for that, and all that. That's not the spiritual sense. Many modern exegetes think it is. And they dismiss it without ever knowing what it really is. And dismiss the whole patristic tradition and the whole liturgical tradition. When we begin the Mass, the morning of Easter, we're singing it in Latin, Resurrexi ad hoc tecum sum. 
I have risen and I am still with you. Where does that come from? It comes from Psalm 139. Those are the very words. Now, taking on a whole deeper new meaning, sung by the risen Christ. You see? So, it's not a theology of interpretation, it's a theology of history. And that's very important. When, therefore, as the Pope is pointing out, when the study of history is not well understood, the spiritual sense is not well understood. So to return to our example, there is Jesus already, as it were, anticipated in the love that David has for his rebellious son. That is a participation in the grace of Christ. And therefore, that weeping stands for, illustrates our Lord's weeping over us. You see where the spiritual sense is? You take the Exodus, and as I say, every term there comes into the uh, uh, New Testament. Take Yom Kippur, Romans 3. Jesus is the Ilasterion. Jesus is the mercy seat. That isn't just some picturesque preacher, preacher talk. What the Ilasterion was, Jesus always is. The place spattered with his own blood by which we are justified. That's the spiritual sense. Now, I'm going to be working on it little by little as we go through, because you see, without it, we only have half the Bible. The Old Testament, whatever was written before, Paul says, was written for our consolation. So the whole of the Old Testament, you see, is written for our consolation and our instruction. I've mentioned this before, but you look, for instance, uh, I passed on to you what I received, namely, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. What Scriptures? This is 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. This is written 50, 60, probably 50. What Scriptures? The only Scriptures around are the Old, the old Covenant. Jesus died according to the Scriptures. Or Luke 24, where Jesus comes, that's the uh, resurrection appearances. They all run back from Emmaus, and then Jesus appears. And uh, first, he went through Moses and the, and the writings and the Psalms with the, the fellas, you know, out on the road. And now, you see, he's there, and he says to them, everything written about the Scriptures is about me. The Scriptures. What scriptures? Or in John, you want to read Moses. Moses wrote of me. Not in some vague prophetic oracle, though there are those. Everything he wrote is mediating events, and those events are an anticipated realization of the events that I bring to perfection in my own life, death and resurrection, says the Lord. So it's extremely important to grasp this. All of our terminology describing the, the work of redemption comes from Exodus. To form a particular people. To uh, rescue. All of this redeem. This is all Exodus terms. What happened at the Exodus is an anticipated realization of the mystery of Christ. And therefore, you see, all of Scripture speaks of Christ. Now we're going to continue to work on that a bit because it's so important. You see, when you have only a rational understanding of history, you can have no spiritual sense. So, many exegetes, usually not Catholic, uh, mock the spiritual sense. But it's the foundation of the whole Bible. All right, we'll continue next week.